Good afternoon. I am Dr. Nordling, and I extend epiphany greetings to you from Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, uh, where we will be looking at the epistle lesson for Epiphany 3, Series B. And let's begin with the collect of the day for that Sunday. Please let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, uh, once again, um, there's really nothing uh, definite for this collect of the day that connects it to the epistle lesson. Um, Although you, we can always talk about our infirmities and to heal and defend us, in this epistle lesson, Paul is going to be talking about, about marriage, whether one should get married or not, uh, in light of the fact that time is short. So, um, from that one seen in that perspective, uh, there may be a connection there. But let's get now to the text, which is 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, verses 29 to 31, and it's coming up. There we go. It's up now. Um, if you look at the, the upper left, I put the text. You can see that the text is actually quite brief, just uh, 29 through 31, but there is an option to do 32 through 35, and that part I put in brackets kind of at the bottom of the, of the page, and that will become clearer. So, uh, once again, the, 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 the gospel for this Sunday is Mark 1, 14 to 20, and that uh, recounts the beginning of Jesus' Galilean ministry, and especially the calling of Andrew, uh, Andrew's brother Simon, i.e. Simon Peter, uh, and then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. That's what's going on in the gospel lesson. Um, of course, there's no connection uh, between this text we're going to be looking at today and the gospel, and that's simply because, uh, as you know, the, uh, liturgically, the, uh, the apostolic letter, uh, the second lesson, is always um, read as a lectio continua, a continuous reading. That's the old tradition so, um, there's some semblance of that here because the epistle lesson for Epiphany 2b, that is last Sunday, is from 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20, and that's Paul's charge to flee sexual immorality, and it ends with the, the statement, ye are bought for a price, so glorify the Lord in your body. So there's kind of the connection already made between sexuality and this text for today. And then next Sunday, the Sunday after this one, when we're going to be doing Epiphany 4b, that's going to be uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 13, which is food sacrifice to idols. So what the lectionary committee has done, obviously, is make uh, this kind of part of uh, practical, the, the epistle lesson is, is from 1 Corinthians and it's chosen kind of practical issues and I think that this text really falls into that category as well. So with that, um, with that kind of introduction, let's get right into the text itself. So uh, Paul says, um, but I mean this, O brethren, tuto defemi adelphoi, the time sunis stalmanos esten. So the time has been made short. Um, sunis stalmanos is from good old sustello, uh, which would be sun stello. They get rid of the new there, and the s becomes very strong, but when you have a compound form, and this is from the perfect here, sunis stello, you're going to have this reduplic, uh, uh, what do you call it, temporal augment here, sun estalmenos estin. Um, so Paul takes up this issue, I mean this, femi tuto. The tuto, I think, is forward-looking, 
uh, this that I'm going to be saying, O oh, brethren. So remember, there's a lot of problems, uh, theological problems with the Corinthians, but he, he continues to call them brethren, okay? Um, then the time, this is the kairos, the kairotic time, the opportune time hath been shortened, okay? Now, there's only one other uh, parallel to this text, and that's in Acts 27, 15, where in the voyage to Rome, it says that when the boat was caught in the storm, that they took in the sails, okay? So that's the only direct comparison between this rare verb and, and this text. So it's taken in, uh, the time has been taken in, okay? So there's a big debate whether this is talking about the final time or if there's some opportune uh, mission time. I don't think we need to get into that, but there you have it. And then he, he has this charge, uh, henceforth, uh, taloipon, and then you have this hina, and hina, of course, is going to signal um, a, uh, a, a subjunctive, and there we have it there. So there's the actual connection um, that uh, uh, those that are having wives be as those who are not having them, okay? So that's how that goes. Now, I, I decided to put it in this order so you could kind of see the structure. Um, Paul has um, actually five different uh, connections here. The first one is those having wives as those that have none. Then in verse 30, those who are weeping as though they're not weeping. So there's the second one right here. Uh, then the third one, those who are rejoicing as those who are not rejoicing. So there's the third item of the, of the structure. Those that are buying as though they are not possessing. So hoi agorodzontes uh, hos me kat ekontes, there's your fourth division. And then finally, um, in verse 31, and those that are using the world from kraamai, which takes a dative, uh, usually it takes a dative, here it takes an accusative, those that are using the world as though they are not kata kromanoi. See that kata there which I have bolded? So uh, kind of like as those who are using the world as those that are not abusing the world. So this is a, a fine um, kind of play on words in the Greek, which is totally missing, of course, in the English, as always. This is why we always have to look at things in the Greek and not just rely on a translation. So five different things. Uh, so what's going on here? Um, I did a little bit of checking, and uh, the, the nearest thing that came to my mind, I got absolutely no help um, from the Concordia Self-Study Bible, which I very much like, the CSSB. But what came to my mind here was the Sermon on the Mount, okay, where you have these different uh, things. It was somewhat reminiscent of it, not, not entirely, but the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew uh, 5 through 7. And remember, uh, Jesus in that sermon takes up different things about murder, but he intensifies it. So you shall not kill, and then anybody who hates his brother is a murderer. Um, adultery, you're not supposed to commit adultery, but everyone who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, divorce, uh, divorce is not permitted. If you remarry according to Jesus, you make your wife into an adulteress. Um, oaths, you're not to, to use any oaths. Um, an eye for an eye, uh, instead of uh, exacting that type of Old Testament vengeance, you turn the cheek. And then um, a, a, a note to the needy. And I thought, you know, I can't take up all of these because they're too long, but let's look at that one in Matthew, or, yeah, Matthew 6, 2 to 4. It'll take me just a second to get there, where Paul says, or, or Jesus says, um, so when you 
uh, pay a vow. Um, don't sound the trumpet before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the boulevards so that they may be glorified by men. Truly, I tell you, they have got their reward in full. But, but as you are doing a vow, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So it's kind of the same idea, not exactly the same, I admit, so that your, uh, your um, not your vow, but your charity may be in hidden, and the Father that sees uh, in hidden will reward you. Okay, so all of these statements from the Sermon on the Mount, and there's some more that go on, work kind of the same way. And here I submit uh, Paul, the Pauline theology, comes close and kind of resembling uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So Paul presents himself, as it were, as, a, as, as Jesus here, <laughs> and he gives practical information um, about uh, what we might call life in the kingdom, especially in, in the Pauline uh, structure schema, uh, now that the time has been drawn in, the time is, is shortened. Uh, and then this last uh, statement right at the end of 31, um, uh, par age gar taskema. So for the outward appearance of the world, of this world, is passing away. Okay, now I did some work on that. And let me put this away here to erase it. Okay. Um, uh, the only other place where that schema occurs is in Philippians 2.8, which is the Christ hymn, where Paul says, and having, a, having been found in schemati, in outward appearance, hos anthropos, as a man. So you've got that, that kind of connection to the Christ hymn there, um, in outward appearance as a man. So here it's the outward appearance of this world is passing away. And this is then why we don't, you know, those that have wives is those not having them. Those who are weeping is not weeping. Those who are rejoicing is not rejoicing. Those who are buying is not uh, possessing. Those who are using the world as not abusing the world. Okay, so those five different things. Um, that's the text for today. It's very short, and uh, my time is getting on. I've got a little uh, <laughs> timer here, and I want to get into the next section. But there you have it. That's that's kind of the of the of the text for today. Um, that when we when we live as Christians in this world, we're not so wedded to the world that we can't get away easily. I think that's kind of the the ethical point of the sermon. It has a practical appeal. And, uh, uh, and Christ and his, uh, his kingdom will steer everything. So that's what you want to do homiletically, is let the gospel prevail. And it has implications for every other aspect of our life. You know, our emotions, our possessions, um, uh, our use or abuse of the world, um, uh, and, and so forth, that Christians who are in the world but not of the world, right? You can see that right here. All right, that's the idea, and however you want to preach that, that's up to you. But let's get on now to the next part, which I have put in brackets, and uh, Mr. Uh, Elmer showed me how to do this. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, see, like I can do this myself now. Okay, so, and now I have to go back to this. Okay, uh, uh, and then uh, verses 32 to 35 kind of give the reason why Paul has made this statement. Uh, and I wish you to be without care. Amerim nus enai. Uh, the one who is not married um, cares for the ta to cure you, the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Okay, so there's going to be um, 
uh, kind of advice given to the unmarried and then to the married man, man, and then it's going to be to the unmarried woman and then to the married woman. So you can kind of see the structure here. It's kind of simple, but I probably could have put the text a little bit differently. But this word, um, amerimnos, um, very interesting word. Uh, it, again, it doesn't occur a lot in the New Testament, but when it occurs extra biblically, it has to do with kind of philosophical repose. <laughs> That's the nearest I can come to it. So it's kind of like Paul is drawing here from maybe Stoic or even Cynic philosophy, and he's putting this, uh, you know, pagan philosophy into the service of the church and the gospel, in, even in terms of his giving advice. And this is something that I've noted elsewhere in my work with Paul, um, how Paul often takes language over and he, he Christianizes it. That is, he takes it back from the devil and puts it into the, the proper sphere for which the Lord created uh, the thing or the concept and, and restores it to us uh, through faith so we can receive it in gratitude. So that's what I think he's doing here just in general. Um, but I, what, I, what I did again was I, 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 I uh, 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 made red uh, the Lord. So Jesus' name is not mentioned here directly how he may please the Lord, uh, to kiryu, to kirio, okay, the Lord. And remember, uh, it says Jesus is Lord, right? So that's who we're talking about here is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, verse 33, and he that has, but he that has been married, gamesos, aorist participle, is concerned for the things of the world, tatu cosmu, how he may please his wife, okay? So Paul wants us to be free uh, as Christians, to have time to be a Christian, if, if you will, um, uh, and, and to spend our time with the Lord. And, and you can see where this goes with monasticism. Monks have, have just withdrawn from the Lord. They don't get married. They have no other kind of connections in this world. Um, and they don't have a wife. But uh, I, I would encourage us to look at it kind of in a more positive way, how he may please his wife, that this isn't something that's antagonistic, but when we're in the marital relationship, we do please our wives in every way that we can. That, that, that is to see it through vocation, okay? Uh, and, and in verse 34, indeed, memeristai, he has been divided, divided between... Uh, the service to the things of the Lord and the things in service to his wife. That's what it means there, this perfect here, memeristai. Let me erase that now. I think I'm done with that. Okay, and the wife, who is unmarried, as he goes on, and is a virgin, or and the virgin, the, the, this chi here could go both ways. It could be a connecting chi or maybe a chi intensive, as you know, there were um, kind of like the office of the, of the virgin, especially in the, in the uh, pastoral epistles. She uh, is concerned, or merimnae, for the things of the Lord, in order that she may be holy, hagia, uh, both in her body and in her spirit. So you've got both body and spirit here. Now, you know, people who are so concerned nowadays about sexuality, why does he make that only of the wife, they, people want to know? Well, because uh, the, the woman is to be chaste and pure, just as, of course, the husband is. But remember, earlier in the letter, Paul has, he, he has warned the, 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 uh, the, kind of the complacent Corinthian to refrain from sexual immorality and not to have concourse with prostitutes. So this is an ideal of Christian femininity and our wives and our daughters um, and our mothers that they're to be holy. 
uh, for the Lord, as well as to exemplify what this is and not live in the way of the world. So I think this needs to come out in your sermon, too. Uh, but she who has been married, uh, uh, he gamesasa, is concerned for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So there you have this kind of parallelism again. Um, pos arisge te gunaiki up here, and pos arisge to on, andri. Uh, so a Christian woman does please her husband and is supposed to, just as a Christian husband is to please his wife. And we all know if you're married what that's like and how difficult that is. And how when we're paying the prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. That seems to be especially for your wife the people that you live with, especially your immediate neighbor, before you go to the one that lives next door in the house next door, okay? All right, uh, so you can kind of see where this is going. Let me erase that. Okay, um, and then verse 35. And, but, but this, uh, so this is how it goes. Lego is at the end of the clause, but that's what we want to say. But I say this, uh, pros to humon auton sum foron. So this is kind of good epistolary Greek. For the advantage of you yourselves is how that goes. So this ta goes with sum foron, meaning advantage. But I say this for an advantage of you yourselves. Not that I... Uh, Brakon humen epibalo, not that I throw a noose. This brakon, at first I thought this brakon meant a burden, which you could see, but it actually means noose, okay, over you. But so that there might be ta euskemon, and this ta euskemon, I believe, is translated, I've got it written down here, because the Greek gets suddenly very tough, that there may be good order is what the editors of BDAG have, and that it may be euparadron, another hapox legomenon. And what does euparadon mean? It means simply um, constant attendance, okay, from you plus paradruo. Paradruo means to sit with each other. So that's, of course, which, what goes on in marriage. Uh, and then you have aparispastos to curio. I forgot to uh, put red on this. To, but you may be without care for the Lord. That is, with, with repose, without consternation for the Lord. So, um, I found a wonderful thing that I'm, I'm getting out of time now. I don't want to go on too much longer, but I found a wonderful thing here <laughs> about the in, impose a noose over you. Um, I thought, I have this in my Philemon commentary somewhere. It took me about 20 minutes to hunt this down. But Luther states here, he hustles young people into matrimony with pipes, drums, and dancing. Mit Pfeifen, Pauken und Tanzen. Isn't that great? They enter the marital estate joyfully and think that it is nothing but sugar. Okay? And then he talks about how princes and lord have, uh, have honor. Uh, as a result, people who do not know better suppose that this is nothing but joy and pleasure. But in this way, God must lure them into a net. Hinan bringen equivalent to en das netz loken, before he throws the rope over their horns. Dem oxen des seil heber die hörner werfen. Okay, so you can see where Luther got this idea. He got this, and this is in Luther's works, volume 24, page 377, also in the Weimar Aufgabe, if you want the German, 46.71. But this whole idea of putting a noose over them, okay? <laughs> so, um, so this last verse, verse 35, is really tough Greek, but there's a lot of wonderful stuff here. But I'm speaking this uh, for your advantage. Not that I may impose a noose on you, 
but that for your good order and your setting well side by side, you may be aperispastos for the Lord. Now, this aperispastos, I got to tell you about that too. Again, it's a hapax legomenon. It's translated without distraction and bedag. And I found this wonderful quote from Epictetus, book 3, 22, 29. Okay? And I translated it for the Greek for your delectation. Is it necessary for the cynic to be completely without distraction for service to God? It's a question. Okay? So the idea, the upshot of this in Epictetus is it's necessary for the philosophically enlightened one to be without distraction and withdraw from marriage and other things in common life. Now, I think that we can't say this for Paul. Paul is using this to talk about how good a thing marriage is. But again, he's disarming the, the pagan uh, philosophical discourse and using it, putting it to purpose for the gospel. Freedom in Christ. Okay? So I've laid a lot, a lot on you. I'm already going on over time. But I just wish you uh, every joy as you preach on this. Um, uh, and uh, that, uh, that you can preach here on marriage. It's so important with all of the chaos and confusion in families that uh, a good witness be made about marriage. We can't preach on that enough right now. And that your preaching on this will be blessed richly in the Lord. All the best to you now.